Good morning. Thanks for joining. I hope you all are doing well. How are you guys online doing? Thank you for sharing your body. Thanks for joining. Hope you're doing well. Um, just give me a quick thumbs up if you can tell me where I'm online, please. Okay. See, check, check. Can you all uh, hear me? Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, great. Well, let's continue from where we left off at the last class. Uh, we've been talking on the holiness of God. Um, the, f the first two chapters was really about looking into um, God's holiness, understanding His holiness, uh, what it did, uh, who is this being we are trying to understand, and uh, who is this being that created us, that made us in His image, in His likeness. And the Bible calls us, tells us that He is holy, uh, His name is holy, uh, everything about Him is holy, uh, everything that He does is holy. Right in His holiness, He is good. In His holiness, He is kind. In His holiness, He is merciful. In His holiness, He is just. In His holiness, He is righteous, um, isn't it? And we see that He surrounded Himself with holiness. It says the Bible says that holiness adorns His house. Right, He's decorated His house with uh, holiness. Um, uh, the language that is used there is so beautiful, so amazing, and. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure I've uh, shared this story before. You would have heard this. There was this uh, singing competition in the uh, Coimbatore of a, uh, yeah. Uh, if you don't remember it, I'll just quickly share it. Uh, but there was a singing competition in a school in a city called Coimbatore. Um, and, um, and the principal of the school said, um, you know, you are welcome to sing. You are welcome to sing any song. Uh, you know that you want to you can sing a song for um, any religion that you want to about any god that you want to but the only condition was that you don't uh, say the mention the name of your of your god that was the only uh, condition that the principal had set so uh, students came one after the other and uh, started singing uh, songs and this is a real story by the way and then there's this one person who comes uh, one student who comes, he picks up the mic and uh, he starts uh, singing and saying uh, Parisuttar. Um, mean, it simply means holy in Tamil, right? Uh, and then principal comes running towards him and he said, like, I told you not to mention the name of your God. But uh, this, he goes saying, but I did not mention the name of my God. Um, then principal goes, who else is holy uh, besides Jesus? Um, see, <laughs> Somehow the world understands and doesn't understand his holiness, that he is holy, and uh, and that's what sets him apart. What sets apart uh, our, our God is that he is holy. That there is no one like him. Yes, uh, and uh, I know we've been talking about this week after week uh, after week, and I know that we've heard about his holiness, and I and I know that. We sing so many songs during worship on His holiness, right? But um, no amount of study uh, we can <laughs> would be sufficient for us to completely grasp uh, this being, um, the one who is holy, right? Because uh, that's what sets him apart. And from the time he called Israel out of uh, Egypt, um, he is saying, "The Lord your God is one, and He is holy." Psalm 22 verse 3 he says, um, God is enthroned in the praises of people. He says, the Holy One of Israel is enthroned in the praises of His people. Right? Um, why should it say the, the Holy One of Israel? I could have just said the God of Israel, which, which He is, isn't it? Um, and there's another time where we see that He says, in my holiness, I have sworn to David, but in my holiness I will not lie. 
we looked at that very specifically saying okay he could have just said i have sworn to david i will not lie why did he have to say i have sworn in my holiness i will not lie why did he have to add holiness there uh, because there's an emphasis isn't it um you know and i know as um adults as growing up uh we've kind of understood that if something is mentioned more than once it's important isn't it like if someone is saying hopefully you understand the weightiness of it okay okay he that person said that twice or he reminded me twice um but time and time and time and time and time and time again uh the scriptures reminding us of who god is and that he is holy he is holy he is and in another uh, chapter three i think last week we did we covered uh, talks about his holiness in in me this is another covenant name is jehovah makadesh the lord our sanctifier so he desires this holy god this God who is set apart from everybody else, that, that there is no one like him. He's just not happy uh, in his place, right? you know, elevated, high above everyone else. But he desires for us to partake in his holiness. Isn't that beautiful? Right? He wants us to partake in his holiness. Uh, that's what Hebrews says when we look at that in uh, and, um eventually but he is our sanctifier he sanctifies us he purifies us are you with me yeah okay so uh, as priests uh our holy uh priests are holiness to the lord we as in the new testament uh we are priest his royal priesthood right in revelation 1 chapter 5 uh, chapter 1 verse 5 and 6 uh, with his own blood he has made us kings and priests uh, these are scriptures that we need to remember when we talk about holiness, uh, not just Isaiah 6 and Revelation 4, that God is holy, holy, holy. Uh, but he has invited us to partake in his holiness. And the price that he paid was by his blood. That means his death and resurrection. Yeah, You remember we emphasized that it's not enough that we only remember what we've been forgiven. It's also important what we've been given. What we've been given is this, his righteousness, and that he has made us kings and priests unto, his, unto himself. Amen? Right? So his people are called to be holy. Uh, and we looked at a bunch of things um, as sanctification, as the process. Uh, in page 31 in your PDFs, I'm not sure what page number it is in your hard copy. Um, okay. And then we looked at, uh, as a sanctification, as the process of holiness, we looked at the sanctification of our mind and our body, um, sanctification of our desires, our affection, and our passions. This is just towards the latter part of the chapter 3. Uh, sanctification of our dreams, of our times, talents, sanctification of our family, home, and possessions. Um, and so, as sanctification, Jehovah Makadesh, the Lord our sanctifier, uh, when we accept him as our Lord and Savior, there are two, two, two truths to that, isn't it? One is when we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths, that there's the positional truth, isn't it? Where I am saved. I am in him and he is in me. Right? And then there is the process that spirit is still living in this mortal body, in the soul, which is fallen. right? And hence the process. And we are going to go just a little bit more deeper in, in that um, uh, on that part okay so uh is are we all on the same page now okay all right so chapter four um titled perfecting holiness um, so we're just going to go a little bit more deeper into this process of sanctification, just understanding, uh, you know, holiness, His holiness in me. Okay, so Second Corinthians chapter seven, verse one. Can someone read that for me, please? Second Corinthians chapter seven, verse one. Therefore, having these promises, beloved. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness 
of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of god okay thank you so therefore having these promises now um any time there's therefore what do you need to ask why is it therefore ask extra stress on the r why is it therefore okay so what is before chapter 7 is chapter 6 what happens in chapter 6 uh huh second corinthians chapter 6 okay he says uh, you are the temple of the holy ghost right and don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers ah uh, you've been set apart he's 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 stating all these standards he's setting these standards he's giving them all these promises and so now when we come to chapter 7 it says okay now therefore having these promises everything that i've declared we don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers uh, don't you know that you are the temple of the uh, of the holy ghost uh, right and then he says having these promises beloved let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness so you see there very important it says let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness that means there's an invitation for you to make an effort in living a holy life cleanse yourself okay now you can i'm i know you have this question it's like oh, but you know what can i do you know it's just jesus who cleanses me and all of that yes that's true uh it's 100 true but that's what we're going to learn and go a little bit more deeper in this chapter and the next chapter okay um so paul is very clear he's saying beloved now that you know that you don't that you shouldn't have to be unequally yoked with unbelievers now that you know that you are the temple of the living god uh cleanse yourselves okay from all filthiness Okay, that means stain of the flesh and spirit. Flesh and spirit. He's not just saying cleanse yourself, wash your hands. He's not just talking about. He's not talking about outward outward appearance at all. Um, so, what are you dealing with in your flesh? And what is it that your spirit's carrying? Are you carrying hatred, bitterness, jealousy? Are you are you are you uh, living? Uh, are you living are you stuck in a habitual sin are you with me right so he's he's presenting the promises before you hey francis you are the temple of the living god that's who you are that's why i died for but then there's an invitation now come cleanse yourself of all filthiness it's a very strong word, filth. Uh, in Greek, it, it's mentioned there as stain, right? It uh, um, must be a very ugly looking stain, isn't it? It's, yes, Alan. Sorry? In the spirit here in this verse. So that's what so see the thing is now filthiness of the flesh and spirit is see now you can no you can you could have given your life to god isn't it but then it's a sanctification is a process isn't it so what is it saying is that the way we can't for example in the last chapter we saw that uh, as an old creation there would have been a certain way how you thought Right, um, that's kind of involved with your spirit and soul, isn't it? Like uh, what you what you do with your body, and uh, you know that has a direct impact on your spirit, your spirit man, as we say it, isn't it? Uh, what did you meditate on? As an old man, you could have meditate on things of the kingdom of the world that could have impact on your spirit, right? And so now that you are a new creation, Second Corinthians five seventeen. I think please correct me if I'm wrong. Second Corinthians 5:17 is saying you are no longer you are a new creation in Christ, isn't it? And so as soon as you become a new creation, uh, the way you think has to change. The way you act has to change. Like the way your lifestyle has to change. As an old creation, if you did not honor your parents, 
you know, in the new as a new creation, you will ha you will have to obey what Jesus taught, honor your parents, uh, live a certain way, and so. I think it's it's kind of correlated there, Anand, the flesh and spirit, because what you do in flesh has a direct impact on your spirit. Right? What you do in the flesh has a direct impact on your spirit. So in the flesh, when you pray in tongues, who's being empowered and equipped? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it says, uh, cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting. Perfecting, forget the words in the bracket, for perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Okay, so perfecting simply is in, an indication of a, prog uh, a progress, like you are a progression. It's a continuation, it's a process. Okay, so uh, now we can look at the words in the brackets there. It's, so perfecting, Greek word epithelio means to fulfill further, to accomplish, finish, or bring to completion. How will you bring something to completion? Is that you go through that process. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. So now it's saying, therefore, having the promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, going through the process of holiness. How? In the fear of the Lord, in the fear of the one who has called us, Know the one who has called us and then set yourself apart. All good? Okay? Yes? Good. So now this scripture tells us cleanse yourselves of flesh, of, of all filthiness in the flesh and spirit. So how do we do that? Is what the next section is about. Okay? He's not just given this, this that's the beautiful part about our God is that He's not just told us how to live. And uh, I mean, like this is how you should be, and it hasn't you know left us to figure it out by ourselves. Do you understand? Like he said, okay, be holy for I am holy. You know, before we ask the question, okay, so how should we be holy? He's spoken in his word. Yeah, um, you know, one of my favorite instance is uh, in. Uh, <laughs> In Joshua chapter 1, between verse 6 to 9, um, I think especially between verse 7 and 9, uh, he says to Joshua, uh, be strong, be courageous. The next verse he says, be very strong, be very courageous. Okay, And then verse 9 he says, be strong, be courageous. So between verse 7, uh, 6 and verse 9, he chapter 1 of Joshua, he tells Joshua at least three times, to be strong and courageous. But not once does he say how to be strong or how to be courageous. But instead, between verse 7 and verse 9, is verse 8, where he gives like a nice note of advice or a suggestion. Meditate on my word. Don't let the law depart from you. Are you with me? So he's saying, okay, by meditating on my word, in my word, okay, day and night, you will figure out how to be strong and courageous. Because I will teach you. Uh, yeah? <laughs> okay, so uh, that's what we're going to look at. Uh, he's invited us to cleanse ourselves and, and live a life of holiness. Um, so how do we do that? First thing is we are empowered by the spirit of holiness. We are empowered by the spirit of holiness. His first name is what? Holy. Hmm. So if you have to live a life of holiness, who's going to help us? Thank you. <laughs> it wasn't a tricky question. Holy Spirit. And he is the spirit of holiness. Yeah, and uh, again, so in uh, the previous scripture it says, let us cleanse ourselves. That means there's an invitation now, I can give you an invite. It is your choice to respond to that invite, RSVP. Okay, you, you can either choose to go to that uh, wedding or not go to that wedding. But the invitation is given. Yes or no? And so similarly here, we understand that we are empowered by the spirit of holiness. Uh, you know, another name for, for the uh, Holy Spirit, we see that he is a teacher, isn't it? Now, I am your teacher here in this class. Who am I going to teach if nobody shows up? 
Uh, so if you don't show up for class, how will Holy Spirit teach you? <laughs> I understand. You have to respond to the invitation, isn't it? Okay, it's not just enough to recognize and acknowledge that, oh yes, Holy Spirit is a teacher. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to allow him to teach you? Yes, that's what uh, it goes on to say. In Romans chapter 1, verse 4, he says, And declared to be the Son of God with the power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. He is the spirit of holiness. Romans 15, 16, That I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. He empowers us. He sanctifies us. Why? Because He is the Spirit of the living God. He is our sanctifier. Yes, so, yes or no? Hey, again, uh, in the tabernacle of Moses, uh, we see that there is this water uh, in the outer courts, in the bronze laver, all right? The bronze laver where it's filled with water for the priests to cleanse themselves before they enter the holy place. Um, and the water, I mean, of, of the many symbols that there are in the Bible, uh, the symbol for the Holy Spirit is the water, right? He's the, yeah, he's the river of life, as we call it, right? Uh, he cleanses us, he refreshes us, he brings us to life. And so, uh, Allowing the Holy Spirit to uh, sanctify us is uh, crucial. Now, if you if you read uh, Romans chapter eight, Ephesians chapter five, um, Ephesians chapter five, it starts off with this statement. It depends on which version you're reading, but uh, it says, "Be imitators of Christ." Ephesians five. We famously used to call it E five as a chord <laughs> e5 uh, be imitators of christ and then we know this famous scripture in verse 18 it says don't be filled with wine don't be drunk with wine but be filled with the holy spirit right uh, so allowing him to fill us and then galatians chapter 5 says we don't walk in flesh we walk in the spirit we are commanded to walk in the spirit Okay, so again, reiterating that point, um, how do we cleanse ourselves? By allowing the Holy Spirit to empower us, um, right, and allowing Him to sanctify us. Okay, that word is very important, allowing. That we say yes to His class and attend to His class. Amen? Okay, um, the next point is we are sanctified by the word. We are sanctified by the word. Now, we know in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, can anyone say what that is? Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Let's go there. Thank you. So all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable. Uh, sorry? Yeah. And profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Now, uh, it simply says all scriptures are God-breathed. That means it is an inspired word of God. It's inspired by God. Now, inspired, inspiration, is an old Latin word. It simply means in spirito. That means by the Spirit, in spirit. So when we say that the Bible is the inspired word of God, uh, the Holy Spirit helped men to write it out. So here we have the person of the Holy Spirit himself uh, sanctifying us, empowering us to live a life of holiness, and then as if that was not enough, he's also given us his word, right? It says, John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is, your word is truth.
um, John chapter 8, verse uh, 31 and 36. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. If you abide in my word, if you abide in me, who is the word? Yeah. You are my disciples indeed. Okay. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So abide in my word, abide in me, he says. And so another secret, a simple secret, which is an open secret. <laughs> you heard of that word, open secret? That means everybody says, oh, it's a secret, it's a secret, but everybody knows about it. <laughs> right? It's an open secret, and then there's no big deal. Uh, it says, there's no hiding here. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Why? Because my word sanctifies you. And because I am the word, I sanctify you. Right. Um, there's something very uh, in interesting that I learned recently. Uh, it's such a simple thing in creation, Genesis one and you know, and, and early chapters of two. Uh, you know, when uh, when God wanted to make uh, create the the fish, the sea creatures, He spoke to the sea, isn't it? And then when He wanted to create the trees of the field, He spoke to the earth isn't it? And they all sprung forth. But then when he wanted to create us, he spoke to himself. Now, you see, what happens when you take a fish out of the water to the thing that he spoke to? It dies. What happens when you pluck a tree out of the ground to the thing that God spoke to? It dies. What happens when you uproot yourself out of God? Yeah. <laughs> so that's why he's saying, God knows, hey, that's what, you know, abide in me. I have come to give you life and life in abundance. Right? Um, so God's word has the power to cleanse us. He cleanses us. Uh, I mentioned about bronze laver. But, you know, we all know that the, in the inner part of the bronze laver was made of mirrors, which was used by the women, right? And then we see in James uh, 4, I think, that he talks about uh, how a mirror, uh, he refers to God's word as a mirror, right? A man looks at a mirror, and if he doesn't correct himself, what benefit is it? Like that is the word of God, is that when you look at yourself and you don't correct your ways, what good is it? Right? It helps you to live a life of holiness. Okay, so uh, we are empowered by the spirit of holiness. We are sanctified by the word. And then there are times where God, uh, divine discipline uh, also produces holiness in us. Uh, how there are times where God chooses to discipline us. Okay, um, just so that we can be better. Okay, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10 and 11. Can someone read that, please? Hebrews 12. Verse 10 and 11. Indeed, for a few days chasten us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful nevertheless. Afterwards it yields to yields the peace peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Thank you. Uh, right. So chastened, that word that's used there, for they indeed for a few days chastened us. Now it, seem, it can seem like a very harsh word, uh, but it simply means to discipline or to bring about correction. Okay? To discipline or to bring about correction. Um, now, it, it, that is in, drawn in comparison to how a parent would discipline a child, right? Now, we have to very clearly understand that discipline is so very different, absolutely different from abuse, okay? So when a parent disciplines a child, uh, it is truly out of love, right? So that a parent wants their child to be a better person, to be a better human, right? If a child is... Uh, talking with, uh, is being disrespectful towards elders, a good parent 
would take that child inside the room. Come, let's have a word. If you're an Indian parent, it would be a little different. <laughs> uh, today, we have all this gentle parenting. I don't know what gentle parenting is, guys. Uh, you know, it's like, OK, it's all right. No problem, you know. <laughs> I'm sure we were not uh, used to gentle parenting, but says, you know, suddenly my dad would become Jackie Chan and all of that, you know. <laughs> Before you know it, phew, phew, you know. So, <laughs> uh, but the point here is that uh, the Lord chastens us, or He disciplines us because He loves us, right? He loves us as a parent would correct her, you know, his or her child. Um, he corrects us because he takes interest in us. Yes or no? Uh, and you know, you would not necessarily take uh, make an effort to correct someone that you don't really care about, isn't it? Hmm. I think, hey, yeah, that fellow. You know, why should I care? You know, what's in it for me? Why should I waste my time in telling that person? You know, that they can be a better person. I don't care. I don't care if he falls in a ditch with me, right? But he corrects us because he cares. He loves us. And and that first part of that verse, verse 10, is so beautiful. It says, for they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he, for our profit, for our profit, why should he, God of the universe, worry about our profit? <laughs> that we may be partakers of his holiness. So when we allow our God, allow the Lord to correct us, to discipline us, to chasten us, uh, we are partaking in his holiness. Now the other section says, now uh, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. That means uh, when a child is corrected immediately, you don't always see, yes, mommy, yes, daddy, I understand what you're saying. No, there will be one tantrum. Uh, <laughs> right? No, you have had enough chocolates for the day. No, it's like, no, I want more chocolates. You know, but the parent knows it's good. You know, it's not good for the kid to have more chocolates. Sugar rush is not going to sleep. <laughs> okay, uh, cavities in the teeth, uh, whatnot. Uh, so we understand that, isn't it? And so. <laughs> Sorry, guys, that's just a hilarious example. But uh, we get the point, isn't it? It's Initially, it may look like it's a pain. We don't enjoy it. We don't like going through it. Right? That's what it says. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. <laughs> Nevertheless, afterward, it yields a peaceable profit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Again, another example from parenthood is uh, I'm sure that there were things that we didn't like when we were young that our parents did to us, when they corrected us. But now, on the hindsight, we can look back and say, I'm so thankful that my parents were strict, that they didn't allow me to go to all these parties. You know, I'm, I'm thankful because they were strict. You with me? At that time, it might seem like, oh, why can't I enjoy my life? Why are you my enemy? Don't you care about my joy? <laughs> you know, uh, uh, why do you want to spoil my joy, etc.? But then, on the hindsight, uh, we turn out to be grateful, isn't it? And that I think you'll kind of understand when you become a parent. <laughs> like, hey, it's for your own good. It's for your war for my own good. You know. <laughs> Uh, but that's what's happening here. What's Hebrew is uh, he's trying to say, and um, you know. But then again, because God continues to love us, and if we don't respond to His correction, if we don't respond to His discipline, um, every action has consequences. Yeah, and that's something that uh, God can't really interfere. God is sovereign, but we also have our responsibility. Right? If you remember a point from uh, healing and deliverance, uh, is uh, there's the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. Yeah, uh, I can't drink and drive and crash the car somewhere and then blame it on the minister of transport. 
okay provided the roads are nice <laughs> right the roads are nice beautiful highway and all of this uh, i can't be reckless in my driving go crash the car cause an accident and then say it's like because of this transport minister i went and crashed there's no connection isn't it um so everything has been provided for us a good road good highway system signals all these guidelines have been provided now it is up to you be to be responsible and to and to respond well are you guys with me understanding isn't it okay so that's the third point in looking at the divine discipline produces holiness in us uh, that is the key point there divine discipline produces holiness in us so what was the first thing we saw that empowered by the holy spirit it has to resonate with us guys okay we are empowered by the holy spirit Okay, if John in John chapter 16, verse 7, if Jesus said that it is better for me to go away so that the Holy Spirit can be with you, Jesus, the Son of the living God, God incarnate, an expressed image of our Father in heaven, if he is saying that it is better for him to go away so that the Holy Spirit can come, means Holy Spirit has to be very important. Right, so we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. We are sanctified by the Word, uh, and then uh, divine discipline. And finally, uh, consecration, walking blameless in holiness. Walking blameless in holiness. Uh, we know this scripture from Leviticus chapter twenty, verse seven. It says, "Consecrate yourself." See how it's related to the previous scripture that we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 7? Cleanse yourself. Exactly. So that means there is an invitation that the, you have a responsibility. Consecrate yourself, therefore, and be holy. Be set apart, for I am the Lord your God. Verse 26 from the same chapter of Leviticus, uh, it says, And you shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples, that you should be mine. Okay? Simple understanding, we are not, we are not set apart for the sake of being set apart. Right? You would have heard me say that a million times right now. Right? We are not set apart for the sake of being set apart. We are set apart unto the Lord. Right? We are set apart unto the Lord. Uh, why is God giving Israelites uh, this commandment in Leviticus? Because every other nation around the nation of Israel were worshipping all kinds of gods, were practicing all kinds of wickedness, from sexual immorality to idolatry, etc., etc. And then God is saying, I don't want you to be like the peoples around you. I want you to live by my commandments so that everybody around you will look at you and know that you are set apart, that you are different. But there is an invitation, consecrate yourself. God is not going to force holiness on you. Right? He's not going to force holiness on us. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 29 30, we know this famous scripture. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it and cast it. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it and cast it away. I mean, I, I really hope that you understand that it is not literal. If it was literal, none of us would be having eyes and legs, uh, hands. <laughs> okay? Uh, we, we understand, isn't it? He's saying, just be cut off. Again, cut, being cut off simply means, is the root word of being holy. is to be cut be set apart to be separated right like what we use the knife in the kitchen is we cut uh, what is useful we put it aside isn't it that's, that's exactly what it is but we have to allow we, we we submit and surrender it before god right have you ever seen a doctor running behind a patient to operate him okay let's say there's a tumor in the brain that needs to be cut. Have you ever seen? I have not. 
Uh, it's like, come here, come here, come here, come here. I love you. I care for you. If I don't do this, you will die. No. The doctor's responsibility is to diagnose and tell you what's wrong with you and tell you that that needs to be cut off. And then it is the patient's responsibility to get admitted. You know, after getting all the insurance papers and all done. So, and then come and lie down on the bed and say, okay, doctor, do your thing. And then the doctor will do his job. That was a strange example, but I hope, <laughs> but you know, I conveyed the point, isn't it? So you, we allow, I mean, it is our responsibility, right? And our, but our responsibility is to come before God in absolute surrender and say, Lord, here I am. You are my sanctifier. You sanctify me. Where you are the living word, wash me with your word, cleanse me with your word. I surrender in all my ways. I want to acknowledge you. Yes? Um, so how do we know? The question then begs, how do we know that we are progressing in holiness? What kind of test can we give to check yourself that, OK, yesterday I was here, today I'm a little better? What can we do? What kind of litmus test can we do to ourselves? Um, and the scripture again points to us and says, uh, First Thessalonians chapter three, verse twelve and thirteen. First Thessalonians chapter three, verse twelve and thirteen. It says, "And may the Lord make you increase and abound." What does that simply mean? To be full and overflow with what? In love to one another and to all. All means all. That's all all means. Right? <laughs> now may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness. Huh. You see the answer there? So that we may be established, we may establish uh, your hearts in blameless and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So, how is, uh, how is the holiness and love connected? God is holy, scripture says, and God is love. He is holy, He is love right and so are you walking in love it's a simple question to ask are you walking in love towards all people are you walking in love towards one another right um i don't want to talk about worship but uh i'm just reminded of something because we are talking about love at the core of what worship simply is is you expressing your love towards Jesus? Yeah? Yes or no? And one of the first things that Paul writes to the Church of Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is love is... Thank you. Love is patient. Uh, it simply means we cannot rush love. We cannot be in a hurry in our worship. Right, it is. It is like okay, 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 okay. Do something fast. Do something fast. Okay, I love you. Okay, fast song. Oh, da, 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 da. Okay. but it's about just being in His present, patiently waiting on Him. Yes, and that is how we express our worship, our, our love, and and so when you say that uh, we are to, you know, uh, abound in love and walk towards, uh, walk in love with towards one another, um, one of the key element there is patience. How patient are we with one another? It's another meter that you can check. Awake. 1 John 4, 16 says, And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. So the language is changed here. This same John who wrote the Gospel of John, he says, Abide in him. Right, that what Jesus tells him, he said, "If you abide in my word, I will abide in you." But here, 
it's, it's, just, it's the same John that's writing this epistle is saying, uh, if you abide in love, you know, who abides in love abides in God. It's quite interesting, isn't it? So walking in love empowers us to walk in holiness. That's wonderful, isn't it? Walking in love empowers us to walk in holiness. We are allowing God to sanctify us. We are allowing Him to consecrate us. And as a conclusion, the last part, we see that uh, godliness, again, the connection between godliness and holiness is going beyond externals. Uh, there are a few verses that's mentioned there. All of that, just one verse in Psalm 51, verse 6, that says, Behold, you desire truth in the inward part, on the inside. How's your heart? That's why the psalmist makes the most audacious, uh, audacious prayer. He says, search me and know me and see if there's wicked ways in me. He's saying, go deeper, go inside, not just the outside, because I know that's what matters to you. And that's where the godliness kind of grows. It's from our heart. Great. Godliness is practicing holiness from the inside out. Yes, I mean, how you live your life, your actions, what you do, and all of that is important, but then we can't just limit holiness to your attire the way you dress or your outward appearance and all of that. It's beyond that. Okay, is everybody good? All good? Cool. So that is the chapter, uh, Perfecting Holiness. Uh, after the break, we'll continue with the next one. Okay, on why personal holiness. All right, I'll go for your break, and I'll see you next hour. Thank you.